Hi, everybody, and welcome back to A Catholic's Perspective, the podcast all about being a young Catholic surviving in a secular world. Today, I have a special guest with me, a friend. I think we've been friends for about two years now since the book club first started, um, and I have with me Jarell Guzman. Welcome. I'm so happy you could finally join us. We've been talking about this for forever. Yeah. Um, yeah, so as as stated, my name is Gerald Guzman. Uh, I'm currently a seminarian for the Diocese of St. Petersburg. And yeah, it's crazy to think. Oh, it's been it has been two years. Uh, I think it was fall of a couple years ago. Yeah. Uh, and man, the book club was was so amazing. Uh, a lot of times, I can get caught up in myself and just like let myself get lazy. So when I I go round up to the start of the week, it's like, oh wait, I need to read those chapters for screw tape letters, uh, or for for the imitation of Christ. It's like, yeah, let's let's get something going here. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I've been, I'm currently in my third year of what we call the discipleship stage of, of seminary, uh, of diocesan formation. And so currently I'm working towards my undergraduate in, uh, in philosophy. Uh, and so, yeah, I've uh, been here, born and raised in Tampa, Florida, uh, entered the diocese right out of high school. Uh, and I graduated in 21 from Jesuit Tampa and have been rocking and rolling since. Uh, this this year I've had the opportunity to head our apostolic committee at the seminary. Uh, so the, the less glamorous part of that includes uh, serving the sick in our community, um, in our seminary community. So if guys are mm -hmm. under the weather, uh, we make sure uh, there are priests that can bring communion to them. And we have guys bring them lunches and dinners. And uh, we also set up uh, the our semi-annual or biannual come and see, uh, where we have a sophomore from the community share the vocation story and to upwards of like 200 guys that we had last spring. Wow. And so been doing that. Didn't lately. you just do that? Uh, yeah. So that, so, uh, yeah. So we had, I think our total count was like 170, 180 guys wow. coming from throughout the Southeast. And so I was, I was like the MC for that weekend. So I led mm. in prayer, helped serve, and then uh, went off for 30 minutes about my vocation story. So. I think you sent that to me. I don't, you sent me a couple of them, but I listened to them and I was just like, ooh, Jarrell's going to be a really fun preacher. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to, are you going for priesthood? Is that what your end goal is? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, it, it was really funny. Uh, after my talk, there were a couple of times where like I, I started breaking down. Um, mm. I, that didn't really happen in practice, but uh, afterwards, like I was already, I was already kind of, not that I was like sad or anything, but it was just like, it was really invigorating. And I'd already cried twice during the talk. And then the rector of our seminary comes up to me. He's like, Drew, we're really proud of you. And he like taps me on the shoulder. And like, I, I literally just sunk in my seat in the front of everybody. <laughs> um, but <laughs> One of the weirdest compliments I got from that talk, I, I went to lunch later that day, and when, there was a priest that came up. He's like, "Man, you you really reminded me of like a, a Baptist preacher. Like you're really lively." I was like, "Thanks, <laughs> thank you." Um, <laughs> I love that. It's kind of like you know Keith Keith Nestor, mm -hmm. um, good friend of mine. It's like the same vibe. It's like very, you know, you could tell that Keith was a Protestant pastor, but he does it in such a wonderful way that you're, you know, he takes the energeticness, energy, that's not a word, from <laughs> that and he puts it into Catholicism. I feel like you do the same, the same thing. And it's like really cool to, to kind of like witness that because we don't have a lot of people who I think are able to be super passionate. I mean, I've been to a lot of talks and things and not to say that they're boring, but I mean, you want to be able to to get your audience into what you're saying. You want to be able to um, get them excited about the faith and and stuff. And so um, I've only met a very few amount of people besides you who have been able to do that. So it's it's really cool. Thank you. Yeah, of course. But yeah, I love hearing about it. And I know that a lot of people are discerning the seminary right now. And so I guess kind of just jumping into your story, tell us a little bit more about yourself and your background, education, whatever you're comfortable with sharing. Sounds good. Um, and so fun little startup about my, like my, my background, both my parents are from the Philippines. 
And interestingly enough, both of them like were deeply discerning religious life before they entered, uh, before they got married. Uh, my dad was thinking of of joining an order by the uh, by the name of the Redemptorists in the Philippines. And so while he was in high school, he actually entered the novitiate in the Philippines before his family moved over to California. And my mom wasn't necessarily looking at an order, but she felt really called to the religious life as well in the Philippines. Um, but because of a family, uh, like providing for a family, she ended up going to uh, become a physical therapist over in America. Uh, and so really funny, funny enough, like a lot of a lot of the Catholic community, the Catholic country of Philippines, a really tight knit community, especially around Manila. And so they both got to know each other in uh, in elementary school. And when it came time for my dad to move over to the Philippines, my mom stayed back because uh, he moved over in, in high school and my mom uh, stayed back until she had finished college. And so when she had the opportunity to move over to America, uh, she got she had a map of the United States. My my dad is in San Francisco, and and my mom he, she knew my dad throughout elementary school into high school, and she didn't want to see him like too clingy, so she was like, "Let me, I, I want to stay like kind of far away, but I don't want to be too far." So, <laughs> I think Florida is going to be the nice choice. It doesn't seem too far on the map. So apparently they didn't have a scale on the map because my mom moved to Tampa, Florida, um, and <laughs> it's a little far, a little bit. <laughs> and so. Uh, Eventually, uh, my dad moved over with my mom uh, in Tampa, and so they, they got married there, and about uh, 10, 15 later, a few years later, they had me. Um, and so coming from a very strong Catholic background, credo Catholic, interestingly enough, a lot of my background uh, wasn't really with the diocesan priests. Mm -hmm. um, the first parish we went to primarily growing up was Most Holy Redeemer. Um, and it, it was in the diocese I currently am studying for, but it was it was led by Franciscans, and it was it was a really amazing experience. The Franciscans were only there until I was in second or third grade, but it was a really beautiful experience. And and looking back on it, it's like, goodness gracious, I, like it was it was so normal to me. But the the pastor there, Father John Aurelia, he served with Padre Pio. Oh uh, wow. And and was fir firsthand witness to Padre Pio Stigmata, and it was so odd. Like me as a as a child, I was like, yeah, it's kind of normal. Like of course my my pastor served with a saint. Just like whatever. Um, <laughs> and, and so it was, it was around the time I was at uh, at Most Holy that my my mom and and I like uh, reserving like the early years of my childhood as like my my oddly like sanctoral life of like my mom has a bunch of facebook posts from when i was younger that like in the most humbling way i could say like i just sound like straight out of a hagiography uh there was a facebook post from i think like 2007 and she was like she i was like literally four or five at the time and she was uh she just literally posted on facebook like i was i was wondering today like with my son, like, man, like, I wish we could be like those in the Old Testament that I like, could hear God's voice. Mm. And of course, like five-year-old me and the deep wisdom that I had gained, uh, just like blithely said, yeah, like, but we can, like, I don't, I don't know why we need to pretend like we're not the Old Testament. Like we have the Bible, like God speaks to us through the Bible. And I remember my mom telling me that literally when I was interviewing for the diocese, I was like, there is no way I, as a five-year-old said that um and, and that so is so years... funny <laughs> baby jarell dropping dropping bombs there <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh and so so literally a couple years later we're, we're at the cathedral in our in our diocese and uh right at the con consecration oh so another another story real quick about me just being randomly christ when i was young uh i we were at the at the cathedral and my, my mom and my dad are looking for like where the main church is. And so they're like scrambling, a lot, scrambling around for a while and they, they lost me. And so they end up finding me in the cathedral. <laughs> and so they, they asked me like, Jarell, like, where have you been? And again, I, like just me casually quoting scripture as a seven-year-old, don't you know I should be in my father's house? Like, <laughs> 
And so, and so literally that mass, uh, at least from what I remember my mom saying, that mass, right at the consecration, I like tugged on her, uh, on her dress and I like whispered in her ear, I, w- I want to do that when I'm older. Oh, uh, <laughs> little baby Jarrell. <laughs> and so, uh, so that, that like oddly like sanctoral life was kind of followed by like my kind of like what I like to term like my paganized days. Um, I, I wasn't necessarily like worshiping Baal, but like I just entered into this like kind of life where, man, like I was, I was pretty set and like, uh, I was, I was very affirmed, especially through the the Capuchin friars at my first parish, like very uh, well affirmed, like in my call as a priest. I remember the day the the Capuchins had left uh, Florida at the last mass at, uh, on a weekday that the that the priest who had served with Padre Pio gave. He had called me up to the front as like an eight or nine year old, and he said, "Guys." in front of you is a future priest. And like, blind, I just like blindly forgot about that for the next like eight years of my life. Um, but in in that time, uh, I we after the, the Capuchins had left, I had a little bit of contact with diocesan priests um, before I ended up moving to my current parish, Mary Help of Christians. And uh, it was there that I was able to encounter the Salesians. Um, and it, it was through this time that I got involved with the summer camp there. And I got to see like a really beautiful aspect um, of like, of just like the swath of, so to speak, priesthood, um, like through both religious life and the diocesan life as well. And it was, it was at Mary Help that uh, kind of to fast forward up into my high school years uh, was like really instrumental in, in me being able to grow my faith life. And it was incredible, like over the summer, I credo Catholic went through Catholic school all my life. Uh, but there was something really incredible over the summer being able in a sense to continue that and to have opportunities for daily mass, being able to kind of help like catechize um, as a counselor. Uh, and it was, it was just a really beautiful opportunity uh, to just kind of like work out kind of like where the Lord was calling me. I I had contact with uh, with the Franciscans. I had contact with the Salesians. Uh, going down the list, I'm missing the Dominicans and the Jesuits. And so in high school, I went to Jesuit Tampa. And uh, the reason I, I like to call that that situation from like about my nine to like seventeen to eighteen, my pagan days, is just I, I really allowed myself to just like sink into kind of an indifference to the faith. Um, we'd go every Sunday, uh, we'd, we'd pray rosaries every now and then when we had the chalice for vocations kind of fitting. Um, and it, it didn't necessarily like seem, uh, like a lived experience for me. The faith was pretty much relegated to Sunday. Um, like I had this really cool thing going on over the summer, but there, there was something that just didn't click. Um, and so one one quote from from Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, uh, God is, encyclical God is Love, that that kind of really perfectly encapsulates like what happened in my so to speak reversion, and this kind of like lightning rod of my faith. Uh, he has this line early on, I think it's like in his introduction, where he says, "To be Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea. It is an encounter with." a person, an event that gives life a new meaning and a new horizon. Mm. And, and for me, especially growing up, like it was so easy to allow the faith to just simply be an ethical choice uh, or to be a lofty idea. Like it wasn't something I could encounter. Uh, Yeah. Like, man, it's, it's really nice to serve, but it it just, it just seemed like an ethical choice of like, do I want to sit with my parents or do I want to just do stuff up there? Um, And there was there's something so so incredible particularly like right right before covid um that that hit this like lightning rod of an encounter and so in the midst of this kind of like dry spell from like close to a decade of like the middle part half of my life um (laughs) and 
the the sense of just like allowing the faith to simply be an ethical choice, uh, to simply be a lofty idea. Uh, and it was this radical moment in in the middle. This was right before ever, all the lockdowns hit. And I was in my my Christian morality class at, at Jesuit Tampa. And I was like, I, I always kind of ignored uh, the, 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 the theology classes there. Um, but there was one day that really piqued my interest. We were we were going through um, the moral teachings of the church, and lo and behold, we hit this like lightning rod. I hit this encounter like with truth with Christ um, through my theology teacher, and he just like simply um, said, "Yeah, the the church doesn't uh, support uh, same sex unions," and that like really hit like I like. For me, the the like on Sundays, uh, just like in in simple talkings on about the faith with my family, the, there was a sense of like same sex attraction was just like simply a, an accepted reality for my mm -hmm. family, um, and so it really piqued me. It was like, wait, there's something that like I've held to just kind of be normal, but like my teacher is here saying that the church doesn't support it, um, and so I, I approached. Uh, the teacher after class, and he was, he was very, very good. Uh, he, he didn't just like hit, hit the hammer on me and just like pointed to the catechism and said, yep, like it's right here. I don't need to say anything. Um, and it was, it was really beautiful the way he, he catechized me about it because he, he framed it like specifically from the point of view of love. Hmm. Um, that like the church does this specifically out of love for those who have same-sex attraction. Um, and like, I, I, I can't even remember how like blithe and like how like meaningless my retort was to that. Um, but he was just patient he was like, yeah, uh, like we can talk about this more if you want to, but yeah, just like study up on more and like what the church has to say about this. And so this encounter, this event, like was very, very tangible. Um, it was an encounter like on this, like really like meaningless day seemingly uh, during the week at Jesuit high school. But there was something so beautiful about it. And it was something encapsulating of like, man, like I'm, I was a junior when this happened. And like, I was thinking to myself, like, I'm going to be in college in a couple of years. Like, do, is this, this faith that I've held to simply be an ethical choice and a lofty idea? Like, do I actually believe in it or have I just like grown up in it? Um, and am I just going to fall to the wayside? Like I've seen so many people who, who've graduated do so. And lo and behold, a couple weeks later from that, the lockdowns hit. Mm -hmm. And for, for all the, for all the, 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 the bad that that provided, it kind of gave me the opportunity to hit a lot of zoom calls on zoom classes on mute and just like absolutely bl like blast catholic podcasts left and right um i remember throughout from from that spring on it was just like constant like catholic catholic answers and matt frad just like mm. just blasting on like through my my headset uh and just getting to learn about such great truths of the faith uh and it was a really incredible experience of of not simply letting it be a lofty idea that these ideas like actually challenged me um, of, of being able to investigate the, the truths of the faith and ultimately like enter into deeper relationship with Christ. And uh, it, it was really incredible right as the summer hit, I would just been listening to hours on end of these podcasts. I've been like soaking up, I was like a sponge, like soaking up like hours upon hours of Catholic media. And I just needed to ring myself out. Um, and so like, it, what better way to do it than at the summer camp that I'd been working at my entire time in high school. And very fittingly, because it was, it had been the middle of COVID, the, the parish didn't want to bring a lot of people from the outside. So they just flew in five Salesian novitiates for, oh, wow. for the party of that summer. And so I, <laughs> I was like, from like 7 a.m. to 5 p.m., I have these guys who are about to enter into formation with the Salesians. I just like absolutely went hog wild, uh, just like 
basically like listening to the same Matt Fred podcast, like like I remember, like literally three hours on end, and just like going to each and every novitiate and being like, "Did you know this? Did you did you know this?" And I, I remember distinctly one one uh, moment of of my counselor uh, ship, I guess that that uh, that summer. I was talking to one of the novitiates uh, at the barn, and like we were, we were overseeing a couple of a group of, of kids, and we were like going deep, like philosophically, like we were talking about the Aristotelian golden mean, and like how to apply that to evangelization. Like we can't be like Bible hitting Protestants, but we can also can't be like uh, like hellfire and brimstone, like only Catholics, like how do we like mend this together? And it was like a really like edifying talk. And then we like get snapped out of it. And the woman working there was like, you guys know you're supposed to be watching the kids. And I was like, oh, we'll talk about this later. I'm sorry. (laughs) That is so funny. I think honestly, like so much grace. I I mean, looking back and, and I think that's something that's so important is when we look back on our lives and we think about, you know, our childhoods and and stuff. There are little signs there of what God has wanted for us in the future, but as we grow up and we're adults, we kind of put God on the sidelines because new interesting things pop up, school, friends, you know, experiences. But when we're kids, we're so, um, you know, accepting of God's words and, and of God's love because like God says, you know, let the little children come to me because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. I mean, because they have, they don't have these issues we do as adults where we hinder ourselves from him, um, whether it's subconscious or on purpose. Little kids are just like, yeah, why not? Why can't we do this? Like, what do you want? You know, there is nothing to stop a little kid. I should know. I've babysat four little girls. There's nothing (laughs) stopping them. Um, And so I think it's just so beautiful that you were able to grow up in this space. And then even though you did have that moment of, you know, oh, is this really for me? You're still questioning, you know, it's not like, yeah, no, this isn't for me after the first thing. Cause you said that the same sex attraction thing, that was a normal thing in your family, right? Like they just accepted that. Mm -hmm. So to be kind of challenged on that, um, you know, and then to learn from that and then be thrown into the Catholic sphere of things with COVID and everything, I think it's just, you know, it's really God's providence when we look back on that, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. And, and yeah. I, I love I love that you brought up the the point about childhood, because uh, the, the framework framework of of every single vocations talk I've given, um, it has been precisely from Mark ten fifteen, like unless you become like this child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Mm. And uh, one of one of my favorite theologians, uh, Hans Urs von Balthasar, has a has an eighty page treatise like simply on that verse. Um, and one of one of the lines that uh, I read literally my first night in seminary and kind of like draws a, a beautiful light um, into what you had just said, uh, he talks about this idea of like, what does it mean to be a child? And so he, he responds, to be a child means to owe one's existence to another. And even in our adult, adult life, there never ceases to be a point where we can stop giving thanks for being the person that we are. And uh, like look, looking back on what you would said, like there's, there's such this wonder of of childlikeness that like in being able to see the faith in its like fullness that you do recapture that childlike joy of of gratitude like first mm-hmm. and foremost to god but also recognizing like in in the great expanse of providence like the very specific people that very much so could have been another person but it was this specific person that guided me on that path mm-hmm. And that, man, like th- there's something so beautiful, um, especially in me being a diocesan seminarian, uh, this idea that unlike being a religious uh, uh, priest, which I'm not, I'm not here to say I'm better than, uh, uh, or, or like a li- live, in, live in a religious order, that there's something specific about diocesan life where the Lord calls you to serve a specific place, namely the Saint, Diocese of St. Petersburg for me, and a specific people, namely the people of St. Petersburg, rather than anywhere else in the world. And, and, and for me, 
uh, especially looking back on that very like truncated, like it was like nine months before I heard the call, so to speak. And that it was in and through the diocese, it was in and through my encounter with people in the diocese that allowed me to hear uh, God's call, that allowed me to be more open, like in my reversion, but also like to the fact that like, man, like the Lord placed me here and not there. Um, and, and like through the light of providence, like that's been something that has allowed me to kind of gauge my, like, like the vocation to which he's called me to. Hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I also always wondered, you know, was there a reason you were specifically called to being a diocesan priest as opposed to maybe a, a religious order of priesthood? Mm -hmm. So, uh, to, so to continue on with na narratively after, after the summer, uh, it got to this like really shaky point of like, oh man, like my, my buds, I got to talk to you for like eight hours a day are heading back to New York at the end of the summer. Like, what am I going to do? Um, and so lo and behold, at the barn where I got in trouble for, for not watching kids, one of, one of the, one of the other counselors there who wasn't mad at me, uh, invited me to go to, uh, a youth group in, uh, in our diocese. I was like pretty much down the street. Um, and it was, it was, it was in and through that youth group where I kind of like really felt a call to the diocese proper, uh, that it was really odd. Like these novitiates, they weren't old by any means, but they were just older than me. Mm -hmm. Um, it, so there was something really strange about like getting to just like be among my peers and still get to talk about the truths of the faith, um, in the context of youth group, even outside, uh, there was, there, I remember really distinctly this one really odd moment in my senior year where I was up at like like midnight and I was just like really hopped up on this one uh Joseph Ratzinger quote and I put it in our group chat and like out of nowhere there were like four or five responses like jumping in the group chat and like literally at midnight there was just like a huge swath of like discussion on theology I was like oh my gosh this is incredible <laughs> um and so so not to say like the youth group told me I was gonna make a good priest but there were more than a few people there that like, as I was just like going off uh, on these on these tangents, uh, they would just approach me. Uh, I remember particularly this one moment, uh, I think it was sometime in December and we were, we were going through the liturgy and uh, like as per most youth groups, like there were a couple like short answer questions. Uh, I'm not one to take the short and short answer. So I, everybody like gave their one or two sentence response. And then I like, I rose my hand and like everybody just like slacked off and was like, <laughs> okay, girl's about to go off. And for 10 to 15 minutes, I just like went like absolutely bonkers about the liturgy to the point where like 10 minutes in, I like paused and everybody was like, okay, we can go back to regularly scheduled youth group. I just walked over to the bookcase in the, in the parish room and picked up the spirit of the liturgy by Joseph Ratzinger. Yeah. And just read from it for like two minutes. <laughs> and so like, I was like, so like emptied after that, where it's like, gosh, like none of that made sense. And like, these people are about to chew me out. And so I just like literally like sunk in my seat <laughs> for, for the rest of the night. Oh my and gosh. So, so after, after youth group, I'm like, I'm kind of like leaving with like my, my head over my, my face. Uh, like trying to sneak out and I get approached by this one uh one of one of the people from the youth group and they go Jarrell like man it felt like I was watch watching a Father Mike Schmitz video and <laughs> I I quite literally collapsed to the floor um, <laughs> um and and just like simple like moments like that where uh where I, I have this uh semi joking but also like very biographical shirt that says shoddy said i'd make a good priest <laughs> um and like just really it was it was really incredible uh like through this experience at at a parish where like i was looking around it was like man there are a lot of uh, of my peers here that i i think I, i'd have an opportunity to be a great husband with um and then like every time i turned around it's like man Jerome, have, you, have you thought about the priesthood 
Man, like after a youth group the other night, I think I think you have what it takes to be a priest. Um, and so it's like the, through this encounter, um, in, in a way, like almost like being able to, I won't say necessarily like balance my discernment, um, but the, the Lord like saying that the door, yeah, by all means, here is the door to marriage. But at the same time, like I said earlier, like being able to serve this people rather than any other, um, it, was, it was probably through the people in this youth group and this diocese um, that really kind of like called out my vocation in, in a really incredible way. And, and a beautiful thing that the church kind of distincts is that like my time in discernment isn't necessarily like only mine and the Lord's, like the church has a place in it too. Um, and, and there's something really incredible, especially through like a, a jury of my peers, so to speak, um, that we're able to kind of like call out uh, in a sense, uh, this vocation in me. And mm -hmm. so in recognizing that, um, the, this great, the, the great like providence that like, man, like I could have been anywhere else, but I was in the diocese of St. Petersburg. Uh, I could have been in another group that was just like completely turned off to my 15 minute liturgical rants. Um, but it was like precisely in and through, uh, this youth group that I, I happened upon because I was talking about the Aristotelian golden mean, uh, one random day at camp that really kind of opened up the sense of, yeah, I think there's something really beautiful about parish life. There's something really beautiful uh, about the community that was forming at that parish. And th that ultimately like, yes, I could, I, I could marry one of these, these girls and I'd be ha amazing with that. And I'd love to have a family. But at the same time, I'm, I'm looking around every Sunday and I'm seeing like upwards of like 200 babies in pews. And I'm like, <laughs> it'd be great to be a father to all these kids. Um, and so uh, and it was like in and through that where we're kind of this like this like budding sense of spiritual fatherhood really came out in that place as well. Wow, that's beautiful. And I love what you said. It's like I could have my own, but why not have everybody's <laughs> like <laughs> I think that's so incredible because even the priests at my church, you know, they they have natural fatherhood. You can tell that they would be wonderful fathers, and they are. Like, that's the main thing is that they are. It doesn't matter if you're 80 or if you're two years old or if you're in utero. Like, they are wonderful fathers to help you on your, you know, your spiritual journey. But also, um, when I go to spiritual direction, at least— my priest, he helps me with secular things too. If I'm having issues with a friend, if I'm having issues with my parents, if I'm having issues, you know, in regards to um, my state in life, whatever it might be, he can take the spiritual side of it and tie it in with, you know, the worldly side of it, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> um, but it's just such a wonderful gift that priests have that they are they are fathers, you know, and I, I, I love that about them. And so I guess, you know, with the priesthood, I've heard that numbers are dwindling. I think it just depends on which diocese you're in and, and mm -hmm. you know, what order you're in. But what would you say to those people, you know, who are feeling this tug to religious life for men or women, but they they also feel this tug towards marriage and they just, they don't know, you know? Mm -hmm. This is this is something that, that really hit last year. Um, I was I was just reading through this uh, this document that the the Vatican released on on celibacy in the formation of priests, and this goes like and, and hinders out to all, um, like including religious life as well. And there is this line that like literally like put me in in a state of silence for like close to an hour. Um, I remember, I remember reading that paragraph and just being like, I literally just need to sit down. Um, and so it talks about. It talks about this the sense of this this pull of marriage and the the Vatican states for those in formation a desire for marriage is not an indication that you aren't called to celibacy it just means that the the sacrifice of celibacy is going to be that much more of a sacrifice and <laughs> that like hit like a ton of bricks because like there there's this like inkling side of me especially entering seminary of like yeah like if i do end up like having a really really strong desire for marriage then that's the that's the ticket out right 
Um, but uh, sorry, I just keep randomly quoting. But Balthazar has this amazing book on on vocations called the Christian State of Life. And in it, he has a section that's literally called how the call is made known. And, and he has this beautiful part of like, God can work in a myriad of ways. Like he, he can't lay out kind of this path for one person um, that's going to like ring true throughout all the ages. And, and the call could happen like in by a gentle invitation or a compelling challenge. Uh, and so reading that, I was already a year and a half into seminary. That was a very compelling challenge to me. Uh, that of course, like you, you can't enter into priesthood and the religious life with this kind of like ire towards marriage. Like God has made it a sacrament for a reason. It's a holy institution for a reason. Um, and like to to tell you the truth, like I've in my time of seminary, like the the beauty of marriage has just like butted up all the more of, of being being able to uh, witness like such great families, even my time in seminary, uh, that it opens up like the sense of, I I would have been like, it, I, I'm at a better vantage point of witnessing to um, the beauty of marriage precisely in a paradoxical way, like being out of it. Um, like much in, in the same way where your spiritual director is able to kind of like give you this like wide scope precisely because he's removed from the situation. Uh, and, and like, and to analogize that to marriage, like uh, to, to that, the desire for marriage in the seminary, like I, I've said this a couple of times publicly and I've, I've yet to be challenged on it. So I'm, I'm going to roll with it. Who would have been more challenged by a desire for marriage than the one who created man and woman himself, like Christ on earth. Nobody would have been able to see the fullness of the beauty of marriage more precisely than our Lord. And that the fact that he was able to be on earth and, and live a life of virginity and, and chastity, yeah, like there, I, I can't imagine anybody else in the world who would have had a greater desire for marriage because he precisely was the one that instituted it as as something holy in creation. Um, and so, it definitely, it's not to say it's easy. Like it's not to say like yeah, I can just brush it off like like another like fly off the the vocational shoulder, so to speak. But there, there's such a, a beauty in being able to realize like the 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 more I have this desire, the more I see the beauty. Like I'm entering into a Christ likeness. I'm entering I, I'm I'm called to God willing at the end of my journey as, as a seminarian to precisely be Christ to the world. And how can I do that if I'm like, oh gosh, like marriage, why would I want that? Like what like like marriage is like such that that's a lower tier option. Um, like, no, like if, if you see it in the fullness of its beauty, then that's something you can precisely sacrifice for the good of those that you get to be available to. Mm. And I think that's so beautiful because we all heard those people like, oh, my girlfriend broke up with me. I'm going to seminary. Oh, my boyfriend broke up with me. I'm going to be a nun. It's like, no, that's not. That's not how this works, sweetie. I mean, maybe, I guess, it's a sign from God that that person wasn't for you and maybe religious life, but it's probably not the best way to make that decision. <laughs> <laughs> but I definitely think that as we go in our generation, you know, Gen Z, I think we're going to be the ones who really bring Christ back into the world, who who are really pulling people into faith. I mean, Father Mike Schmitz, his podcast was number one. I think you know, this is going to be the turnaround that we need to bring God back into society. Um, and we'll work on Gen Alpha. Gen Alpha needs help. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but <laughs> I feel like Gen Z, we're, we have our issues too. Every generation has their issues. But I definitely feel like ever since COVID and Gen Z went through COVID, we've mm -hmm. either turned closer to God or we've completely fallen away from him, but I feel a majority of us have turned towards him. So that's something that I definitely look forward to in the future. And um, hopefully we can have you back on in the future too, Jarell. I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your story. Um, where can my listeners find you? Is there anywhere they can follow you? <laughs> uh, so as of now, no, um, but I, I, I do currently have a podcast by the name of Seminarian Sensibilities. Uh, as of a couple weeks ago, we just hit Apple. Um, and so 
uh, I'm on Apple and I'm also primarily on Spotify. Uh, so if you can hit a like and hopefully a five stars there as well, that'd be great. Yes, absolutely. Go follow his podcast. I was listening to it on my way to a dentist appointment, I think. And I was just like, this is so fun. It's like having a conversation with some <laughs> seminarians. It's like so cute. And just like y'all are laughing. I think it's just, you know, we need more podcasts that are like conversational and upbeat. So definitely check that out. And uh, yeah, well, thank you so much, Jarrell, for ha uh, hopping on here and sharing your story. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. And with all of that being said, guys, I hope you learned something and hopefully this inspired you. And I'll talk to you guys in the next episode. Bye. Do you have questions or comments about today's episode? Email me at thereligioushippie at gmail.com or leave a voice message at anchor.fm forward slash thereligioushippie. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Please be sure to rate and review this episode. This podcast is produced by Amber Rose and distributed by Metacortex Publishing. This podcast is copyright by The Religious Hippie NFP. Any previously trademarked or copyright content is used by permission. Information and opinions in this podcast should not be construed as medical advice. Please be sure to visit the official website for The Religious Hippie at thereligioushippie.com or find me on social media for other unique content. Thank you.